listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Michelle Jewell Shaw, the newly elected chairperson of Friends of Portsmouth Arbor Lighthouses. Thanks for being with me today. Congratulations, Michelle. Thank you, Jeremy. And hello to all of our listeners out there. So this is episode 91 of Lighthearted, scheduled for November 30th, 2020. November 30th marks the end of the hurricane season in the United States. This was one of the most active seasons ever with, uh, as of the date we're recording this, 28 named storms and 12 hurricanes. Also on November 30th, 1818, Macquarie Lighthouse in New South Wales, Australia was first lighted. It was the first lighthouse in Australia and still remains in operation today. On November 30, 1782, a preliminary peace treaty between the United States and Great Britain was signed, ending the American Revolution. And on November 30, 1979, Pink Floyd's rock opera The Wall was released. Also on November 30, 1929, the American radio and television personality Dick Clark was born. He once said, quote, I love what I do. I love the invigoration of doing things I haven't done before, unquote. So where are we going today, Jeremy? We are heading back over to the Great Lakes to talk about North Manitou Shoal Lighthouse in Michigan. I'll be talking with Daniel Oginski, president of the North Manitou Lightkeepers. Also later, I'll be talking with Bob Trapani, Jr., lighthouse preservationist, photographer, and author, about a new book he has coming out. First, Michelle, please help me tell our listeners about North Manitou Shoal Lighthouse and our first guest. Sure, Jeremy. North Manitou Island is in northeastern Lake Michigan, about 12 miles west-northwest of Leland, Michigan. The 15,000-acre island is part of Sleeping Bear Dunes National Park. A lighthouse was first established on North Manitou Island in 1896. A few years after the lighthouse on the island was established, it was decided that an offshore light was needed to mark a shoal in the busy six-mile-wide passage between the southern point of North Manitou Island and the mainland. A lightship was stationed near the shoal in 1910. Because of the dangers of ice in the lake in winter, the lightship had to be removed from the station at times. It was decided a more permanent lighthouse was in order. The Public Works Administration funded the construction of the lighthouse, and work began in 1933. A crib, 65 square feet and 22 feet deep, was put in place to serve as a foundation. The crib was filled with stone and cement, and then a steel-reinforced pier, 62 feet square, was constructed on top of the crib. A square steel building on top of the pier supported a lighthouse tower, showing a red flashing light 79 feet above the water. There were also two diaphragm foghorns. A three-man crew typically staffed the light station, with each man serving two weeks on, followed by a week off. The men passed their off hours playing games and chatting on the station's radio. One Coast Guard keeper enjoyed rappelling by rope from the lantern gallery to the deck below. When the light was automated in 1980, it was the last offshore light in the Great Lakes to be de-staffed. It was virtually abandoned after automation. In 2015, the lighthouse was accessed by the Coast Guard and was made available to a new steward under the guidelines of the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act of 2000. No suitable application was submitted, so the General Services Administration held an online auction beginning in July 2016. The auction ended in late September and the high bidders were a group of four Michigan families. The group founded a nonprofit organization, the North Manitou Lightkeepers. North Manitou Lightkeepers intends to restore the station and to eventually open it for public tours and overnight stays. An engineering evaluation was completed and work began in 2017. So far about $500,000 has been spent on restoration with the ultimate price tag of around $2 million. MIM Enterprises Incorporated is a partner in the restoration. MIM Enterprises is a woman-owned contracted company that has won four Governor's Awards and two Michigan Historic Preservation Network Building Awards for their work, which includes work on 16 lighthouses. 
Dan Oginski, president of the North Manitou Lightkeepers, was born and raised in Flint, Michigan. He grew up restoring old cars into show cars, and today he's a senior executive in a Michigan company that owns, maintains, and operates infrastructure in seven states. He lives with his wife, Anna, and three children in Elk Rapids, Michigan. Anna Oginski is also very involved in the preservation effort. I spoke with Daniel Oginski in October. Let's listen to that conversation now. I am speaking with Dan Oginski, who is the president of the North Manitou Lightkeepers in Michigan. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dan. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. You are a Michigan native, a state that has the most lighthouses in the country. But I understand you grew up in Flint, which is not very close to the water. Uh, I'm wondering if lighthouses were kind of on your radar before you got involved with this particular lighthouse? Well, you know... Growing up in Michigan, especially coming from Flint, a lot of what Michigan is known for, among other things, is the Great Lakes and cars. My dad is a mechanic, and we grew up, I grew up working in the garage, and we didn't travel much. And I'll tell you a quick story. Basically, I can't say before we started working on our lighthouse project that I was a lighthouse enthusiast, but I definitely was excited about the Great Lakes and being by the water, and I've always loved history. So that that would draw me to places with lighthouses. And when I visited those places, I always toured them because I love the history of them. And then there was always this feeling like I wanted to climb to the highest spot I could on every lighthouse. So that was my interest in lighthouses before. And like I said, a lot of my interest is being by the water in the Great Lakes. And that certainly has fueled our interest in this project. To tell you a quick story, like I said, when I was a kid, my dad's a mechanic. We worked in the garage all the time. He had a saying like uh, on Labor Day weekend, he'd say, hey, boys, you know, it's Labor Day weekend. You know what that means? Time to labor. (laughs) And we we didn't travel much. But one time we did go on a trip. When I was a young kid, we went on a trip somewhere in a state park in northern Michigan. And I'll never forget getting there, climbing out of the camper and taking a short walk through this trail that was like beach sand surrounded by pine trees. And coming out into a clearing and seeing Lake Michigan in front of me. And I can tell you that was a powerful, powerful moment. It was amazing just experiencing the lake that way. And it it just put a strong feeling in me that uh, just makes me want to be at the water and on the Great Lakes as much as possible. And a lot of what a lot of the adventures I kind of get engaged in these days is somewhat trying to tap back into that feeling and, and have that feeling of being on the Great Lakes. So that certainly has led me to be interested in lighthouses, and lighthouses have a lot of history. And I'd say that's kind of my background that, that kind of leads us to this uh, particular project with the North Manitou Shoal Light. What made you decide to buy a lighthouse? I don't know that I decided to buy the lighthouse as much as was compelled to do it. It really, at the outset, was more of a compulsion. A little bit of an obsession broke out with this lighthouse. And then over time, it does not only myself, but my wife and the other families we founded our nonprofit with and started this project with. um, It really has become a mission for us. But the inspiration does start with the area. Uh, It is one of the most beautiful places in America where this lighthouse is. It's an offshore lighthouse in Lake Michigan. It sits in the middle of the Leelanau County shoreline that includes Sleeping Bear Dunes, National Lakeshore, which is gorgeous. And then obviously that expanse of Lake Michigan in the Manitou Passage. And then on the other side of that are the two Manitou Islands, North and South Manitou Islands. It is a an amazing, beautiful spot. And uh, essentially when I saw the article saying that this lighthouse was up for auction, my literal reaction was holy bleep we have to buy this lighthouse and once i sunk my teeth into the idea it it took root and and the rest is history so far let's talk a little bit about the history of the lighthouse first maybe you can explain a little bit about why a lightship originally and then the lighthouse were placed at north manitou shoal and also if you could uh, maybe explain a bit about the geography of where it is for us us listeners who aren't all that familiar with michigan geography The North Manitou Shoal Light basically was built, and and preceding that, like you said, was a a light ship placed near its location. But that light ship and then this lighthouse being built there 
the purpose of it is to protect shipping passing through the Manitou Passage. If you think about Michigan being the shape of a mitten kind of up in the northwest region, you see the Grand Traverse Bay, and on the outside of that, kind of the pinky of the mitten, you know, on the outside of that, there's two little islands, uh, the North and South Manitou Islands. In between the islands and the shoreline is a shipping lane that has existed for a, a long time, basically since um, shipping started around the, the Great Lakes. It has been a lifeline of the economy. You know, basically North Manitou Island, around it is a shoal of relatively shallow water, about 20 foot depth of water there that extends around and south of that island. So the light ship that was there before and then this lighthouse that was built in 1935, one of the last, actually one of the last lighthouses to be built in the United States close to it, was built on that spot to mark the southern tip of that shoal around North Manitou Island so that ships don't run aground of it. I'm wondering if you could say how many uh, keepers were commonly, you know, typically there. And also, are there any stories that really stand out for you about life at the lighthouse? Yeah, so I have heard that typically the lighthouse would have a crew of three Coast Guardsmen there at a time. And they would work in a rotation, moving on and off the lighthouse in shifts, probably, certainly not every day, but kind of week by week through the shipping season. So typically a crew of three Coast Guardsmen. I've heard a lot of stories about kind of things that went on at the lighthouse, and a lot of it seemed to focus on passing the time. Hmm. There certainly was work to be done. Um, at the lighthouse and kind of routine to follow and maintenance work to do in the lighthouse. But a lot of the stories I te- I've tended to hear had to do with passing the time. So, for example, there was a pool table in the lighthouse, and so a lot of time spent playing pool. The reason I mentioned the pool table is what's kind of interesting is when the lighthouse was decommissioned and, and automated in 1980, that pool table was taken off the lighthouse ended up in someone's basement somewhere in Leland, kind of the closest port town to the lighthouse used, you know, for uh, I've heard stories about teenagers waxing their snowboards and stuff using the table that way. And then it ended up in an art gallery in Leland for a number of years. And now we have it in storage and are going to put it back out of the lighthouse someday. Oh, cool. So, you know, they play pool. Other things we've heard is someone had a motorbike out there at one point or a motorcycle and would run it around the pier deck <laughs> of the of the lighthouse. Wow. Um, I can't tell you how many stories I've heard in town in Leland about people, <laughs> old stories about how they used to boat out there from, from Leland to go hang out and drink with the Coast Guard. Um, that's the most common story here is just how much, you know, it was part of what people used to do is go hang out with the Coast Guard you know, out of the lighthouse. And there's actually one story that one of the former Coast Guardsmen who we've met and was stationed out there said somehow one of his crewmates discharged a firearm. It bounced off, like ricocheted off of a wall and ended up lodging in his arm. And he had to get medevac off of the the lighthouse. And if you go out to the lighthouse, there actually is a mark, a pock mark in the wall where the, the bullet ricocheted off of. Wow. Um, as I understand it. So, yeah, we've heard all kinds of uh, interesting stories about that. <laughs> I guess so. I love the, the story about the guy with the motorcycle out there. That's a pretty pretty funny picture, <laughs> him going around in circles uh, on the deck outside the lighthouse. And it reminds me, there was a lighthouse in uh, Rhode Island, in uh, Wickford, Rhode Island, that no longer exists. But I read that uh, the son of the keeper, he was a little boy, but he would ride his bicycle in circles around the lighthouse endlessly to pass the time. So you know, I immediately yeah. thought, thought of that when you said that. For some reason, it also reminds me of the movie The Shining, if you know what I'm talking about. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah. the little kid riding his, his uh, whatever it was, his Hot Wheels uh, tricycle around the in circles in the hallways. But anyway, that's, yeah. that's, that's another story entirely. So as you mentioned, North Manitou Shoal, it was actually, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it was the last offshore light station on the Great Lakes to be automated and de-staffed, is that correct? That is correct. It was automated and decommissioned in 1980, the last one to uh, to go through that process. Right. So that's, to me anyway, not that long ago. It's about 40 years ago. What well, is 40 years ago, 1980? Right. 
So right. I imagine that some of the Coast Guard keepers are still around. Have you been able to make contact with any of them? We have, and that is an important thing that we're trying to do is be in touch with former Coast Guardsmen. We're looking for others who may have worked there. You know, I, I mentioned that the original inspiration of trying to buy and restore this lighthouse was kind of the thought that the area is beautiful and why wow, it would be cool to own a lighthouse. But as we've gotten into the project more, or really once we started bidding on it and started the whole project taking root, what became a lot more apparent is um, in the bigger picture, we're really stewards of uh, celebrate, you know, first of all, taking care of something that's in Lake Michigan and helping to protect the Great Lakes, but also kind of stewards of the history of the lighthouse. But then also what has been really cool is is coming to understand that we have an opportunity to honor the legacy of the Coast Guard and the people who have worked uh, at this lighthouse and work towards the, the goal of protecting lives and shipping in that area. So uh, one of our favorite things to do is talk with former Coast Guardsmen, especially those who have been stationed out there. And we've been able to get in touch with a number of them. And that has been been really great. And to hear their stories and we get some photographs. And, you know, they generally talk about the lighthouse with fondness and how interesting it was to be out there. And it usually is a mix of fondness for the, the uniqueness and coolness of the experience mixed with kind of the reality of being out there for stretches at a time and and uh, what that can be like and finding ways to pass the time. But we've heard from a number of folks and, and they're kind of part of our team more and more, which is really which is really great. One person in particular who we spent some time with, his name is Colby Tenekill. He's actually the gentleman told the story about the uh, gun bullet being lodged in his arm. Huh. Um, but he's okay. And he's walked with us in parades just as one example. And there are others, you know, he recently donated to us his, uh, what he called his Coast Guard Bible, like his manual that he was issued when he began his Coast Guard career and was stationed at the, at the crib is what this lighthouse is, uh, it's his nickname. And he said, he's going to donate to us his uniform, which would be really great. Cause we can put those uh, that on display in the, in the lighthouse too. So we love being engaged with former Coast Guardsmen, and it has become a really cool part of the experience, um, and it really helps us uh, not only be in touch with, but kind of relate to others the the richness of the history and legacy of the of that lighthouse. Let's talk about your goals, the organization's goals for the lighthouse. I understand the plan is to eventually open it for tours and overnight stays as well. According to your website, it will be opened to the public on July 4th, 2021. Do you think that still looks like an attainable goal at this point? Yes, it is. Our plan is to start running tours by July 4th next year, 2021. I think where we're at is we've made good progress with the restoration we, work we've done so far, enough that it's cleaned up and safe enough to visit, and you can spend a little bit of time there and do a nice tour of what's there right now. You know, it's a little bit more of a rustic experience for now. Later, it'll be more finished and more comfortable, but at least for get you know, opening it to the public and starting tours, we're going to start, we're going to start that next summer. I hope we're really get, excited. Yeah. I hope I can get there sometime. I would love to tour it. Let, I'm trying to get an idea of the timeline in my mind here. You bought it at auction in late summer, 2016, or actually September, late September, the auction ended. I imagine it took a while for the paperwork to go through. So the actual restoration probably didn't start until 2017. Is that correct? Yep, that's exactly correct. We won the bidding process exactly like you said, uh, September 2016. We probably completed the acquisition officially in, I think, May 2017. While that was going on, we were starting to make preparations for doing work out there and that, that got started the summer of 2017. So basically in, uh, what has happened so far is summer of 2017 largely focused on cleaning up the lighthouse. When we acquired it, it was covered with, I don't know, 30 years worth of bird guano from the right. double-crested cormorant. You could you know smell it probably 300 yards out when you started to come up to it. And it was a badly rusted experience exterior really rough shape and then inside just a lot of debris and need a lot of cleanup so the first summer 
really focused on cleaning up the deck, cleaning the interior, and kind of moving towards um, starting to give it a fresh paint job on the exterior. Uh, I think we did get started with that that year, and then moving into 2018, we media blasted the whole exterior. So that's kind of like sandblasting, but using a different material. We media blasted the whole exterior, primed it, fresh paint job, and then through that and moving into 2019, uh, you know, we finished that paint job, and then we it has 22 rectangular window so for those who haven't seen pictures of the lighthouse just think of it like a kind of like a cake but instead of being round it's in blocks with several layers and there are 22 rectangular windows we removed all of those and our contractor moved those to a warehouse did a full restoration of those original windows from 1935 and in the summer of 2019 so last year put those all back in the lighthouse um, and then in the meantime, the other the other work that's gone on had to do with the lantern housing. So the top of the lighthouse where the light is, you know, fully restored that uh, new paint, cleaned it up, replaced all the all the glass that had been uh, replaced with some plexiglass like material. You know, we're talking like diamond shaped, rounded um, pieces of glass going back in and uh, replaced the exterior decking up there all through basically from. Through the summers of 2017, 18, and 19 has been the work we've been able to do so far. And then this year, we've largely focused on getting tools and, and equipment out there so that we can start maintenance work ourselves and starting to stay out there ourselves so we experience what it's like there and have a sense of, of that reality and how it can be for people you know, in the future. I imagine the uh, COVID-19 pandemic had some effect on what you were able to accomplish this year. It, it did, but I think we we're probably, you know, in the COVID circumstances, there's uh, nothing great about it, but there are silver linings perhaps. And, um, or at the very least, I think we're fortunate in a way that it probably didn't hold up too much for us because we had reached a point in our restoration effort where we, we did the major work working with a contractor. We, we completed the major work over the last three years to clean it up paint it, replace the windows, and had reached a point where right now we got a grant from the uh, Michigan State Historic Preservation Office through the Michigan Lighthouse Assistance Program to do a historic structures report. So that's been a fo big focus of our effort over the last year, too. So we're kind of at a place where we did the urgent emergency type stuff that needed to be done, and cleaned it up, and protected it from the weather to stabilize it. And so we could, we and other people could be there, but we also reached a point where we're now getting our HSR done. That's road mapping the rest of the restoration work we're going to do. And this was a good summer for us to start moving equipment out there, starting our maintenance work and spending some time there to give us a more realistic sense of what we should be focusing on, which actually, you know, was not a lot of people and it's mostly outdoor stuff. So I think we, I don't know, we kind of lucked out in a sense that this was a good time for us. It would have been hard to do much more work with the contractor and all that stuff. So we're feel pretty fortunate. We got that work done before this year. And then we're able to utilize this year for uh, a really important stage of our restoration that, that we could still do. Well, that's great. You were able to accomplish uh, quite a bit this year in spite of everything. So it's my understanding you're about a half a million dollars into a $2 million restoration. But uh, I'm wondering uh, how much of the, the rest of the, the money is in place or how much you, more you need to raise. At the outset of the project, we did think it would take about $2 million to um, restore and fix up the lighthouse. We were able to get started pretty quickly uh, with the work we we're doing because the, uh, the four founding families, my wife Anna and me, plus the McWilliam, Caberly, and Buckley families, you know, we made initial contributions to the effort that, that helped us get started. And then we've also raised or built a membership of about 100 people. So with that support, we've been able to do about half a million dollars of the restoration effort so far. And that's been great. We're a stable, financially healthy organization and feeling good about that. As we look forward, we now have not only the restoration work to do, but we've fixed it up enough 
that we have something to take care of. So it's going to be really important to sustain and grow our membership, if nothing else, to support our annual operations, you know, to take care of what we have and kind of continue supporting the restoration work. But other than that, we also are going to be working on uh, securing additional grants, working on a capital campaign to raise the bulk of that money that's uh, still needed for the restoration effort. Now that we've done a historic stru uh, structures report, that HSR pretty much spells out the remaining recommended treatment and the cost estimates for that gives us a nice roadmap, not only for the things we're going to do, but the things we can say to people, hey, here's a piece of the lighthouse that you can uh, that you can build if if you want to you know help pay for doing that part. I think those numbers that we started out with are going to be roughly about right. Although I think some of the amount that we're going to be trying to raise, one other thing we want to do is raise an endowment, which will come as a priority later than the, the restoration itself. But I, I think now we're trying to be realistic, too, and seeing if we can raise an endowment that will help take care of the lighthouse as, you know, into the future once we're done with restoration so that we don't backtrack on keeping it nice. Well, you've accomplished a, a lot so far, and the lighthouse looks so amazing in photographs. It looks like it was just built, you know, it's just uh, looking at your website. That I guess it's drone footage that's uh, very prominent in the front of the, the website is just, just beautiful. We're especially proud of the before and after photos that we see of the exterior. It really was in rough shape, and, and now it's nice. And we're really proud of that. It's really nice to see it with a fresh paint job, you know, gleaming white on the blue lake with the black trim. We love it. Without going into tremendous detail, what, what for the most part, needs to be done uh, to complete the, the restoration of the lighthouse? Immediately in front of us, our highest priorities for restoration are a few things that largely relate to completing work necessary to protect the lighthouse from the elements and increasing the accessibility of the lighthouse. In other words, helping more people get on it more often. So that short short list of relatively big things starts with replacing the sea doors uh, it's a unique feature of our lighthouse especially with crib design lighthouses that we have ingress and egress doors at the water level in the concrete base you can if you can enter and exit those doors if you enter them mm. you come into the basement of the lighthouse we've had a donor step up and say i'm willing to to fund replacement of the sea doors they were welded shut when the lighthouse was mothballed but if we can replace those uh, so they're usable, it'll really help be an easier way to get on and off the lighthouse. Right now, you've got to climb out of a boat and climb up a ladder embedded in the concrete walls, which is doable and actually kind of fun, but uh, will be easier for some people to, to use the sea doors. The other things are replacing the what we call the watch deck. It's kind of the mid-level of the exterior where you can go outside and walk around. And then there's a pier deck that's the base level, um, kind of top of the concrete base. When the lighthouse was mothballed, the Coast Guard, I suppose, or someone welded steel plates over top the decking, those have corroded and need to come off. And then whatever shape the, the decking is underneath those will need to be repaired and recovered. That's really important to do. And then there's some structural repairs because of water intrusion, just some structural repairs to be made and uh, replacing the fence railing on the pier deck, you know, the, the, the base level of it. Those are kind of the things right in front of us that are really important to do to, to protect the lighthouse and increase the accessibility to it. After that, we're really moving to the interior, you know, and doing some other work. But a lot of the rest of the work is the installation of internal systems like plumbing, ventilation, and electrical to make it more historically uh, restored, but also a little more comfortable while we're, you know, re repairing and restoring the plaster and adding finishes and, and cleaning it up. So that is the bulk of the restoration work in, in front of us. And we're looking forward to, uh, you know, hopefully getting some additional grants and also raising money from donors which is going to be really helpful if we can raise money from donors because there are grant opportunities out there, as I'm sure many of your listeners know, but they are you know, somewhat limited and, and tend to be you know, smaller amounts focused on particular projects. They're a very helpful, necessary part of how we're going to store the lighthouse, but we're uh, 
pretty hopeful and optimistic about raising other funds for the restoration from uh, private donors. It's fairly uh, isolated where it is, and it's always a problem with offshore lighthouses. There's always logistical issues, just uh, getting people out, uh, materials to the lighthouse and so forth. Has that presented a, a big challenge for you? Well, really two things. It's two sides of the same coin. It makes it more logistically difficult to do work there, uh, makes it harder to visit and spend time there. The other, on the flip side of that, it's what makes it such a cool, unique experience. And I have to tell you that being out there, having spent the night out there and spent days out there, it's unlike any other experience being on this lighthouse out in the middle of the water and surrounded by so much beauty and it's so quiet and peaceful. It really is an amazing experience. But what comes along with that is some of the challenge of being able to get out there. For the work we have done, we've managed it pretty well, or I should say our contractor has, you know, they're pretty experienced with this. So, you know, they get the right equipment and they've installed cranes out there that we now use. Um, so having two cranes installed in the lighthouse helps us get material and equipment on and off of it. And that's worked out okay. But the biggest challenge we have is the weather. Uh, because it's an offshore lighthouse and because it's in the Manitou Passage, which between the shoreline and the islands almost acts like a wind tunnel at times, and given the fact that the main way of getting on the lighthouse is to climb out of a boat and climb up this ladder, really the wind and the direction of the wind have a lot to say about whether we can get to the get on the lighthouse or not. So that has been our challenge. We were all becoming weather forecasters and much more in tune with weather forecasts because of that, you know, but I think we're handling it well. And if we can get the sea doors replaced, that I think will, will broaden our, our ability to, uh, to get into the lighthouse more often, you know, in a broader kind of window of weather conditions. There are probably precautions that have to be taken regarding uh, impact, environmental impact on the, the lake itself. Yes, um, we care a lot about the Great Lakes. We care a lot about Lake Michigan and protecting it. It's certainly a big part of even why we're doing this project. The biggest thing we've taken precautions around is just the potential for debris going into the lake, given that we're cleaning up and doing restoration work on the lighthouse. But it's um, not necessarily it's more work, but it's not necessarily that too complicated you know, at least with the cleanup effort, our contractor ended up hauling 160 bags, 160 garbage bags off of the lighthouse after scraping bird guano off the deck and all the debris and stuff. You know, it's not not stuff that we said, you know, we, we, we said, well, we can't just throw that stuff in the lake. So we bagged it all up and hauled it off of there. The other thing is when we did the media blasting and painting of the exterior, we built a you know, our contractor built a scaffolding around the structure and enclosed their work areas basically in a, in a tent with mechanisms for containing the debris coming off the lighthouse, particularly when remediated blasting. So essentially, we're containing debris from going into the lake so that we can, you know, protect the, the lake from that kind of pollution. That's been a big part of the restoration effort, you know, going forward. We're going to have to figure out how we have power out there, how we deal with plumbing and those sorts of things. And all of those considerations will include protecting the lake as a factor in how we do things. I was wondering if you have volunteers. Uh, obviously, you, you and your wife are very involved, and I'm sure the other families uh, who bought the lighthouse and are involved in the organization. But do you have uh, additional volunteers? And if so, what kinds of things do volunteers do there? We have had some folks step up and work as volunteers for us, which has been really great. Even more broadly, just seeing the, rea the, the response from friends of ours and other, other people we don't know who just love lighthouses or love Lake Michigan, the way people have gotten engaged has been really cool. We've had a lot of people say, hey, I'd love to volunteer for doing work on the lighthouse. We're now getting to the point where we can soon start taking volunteers out to the lighthouse and doing some actual work on it you know maybe doing some scraping paint prep and paint or even maintenance work to like clean up bird guano or other things that need to be cleaned up at the lighthouse which will be a regular part of our maintenance work some of the volunteer activity we've had so far are things like don shank uh he was a former uh model builder for disney he contacted us and volunteered to build 
a model of the lighthouse, uh, one of which we have and one of which is now in the Leelanau Historical Society Museum in Leland. He also made like a stained glass window that is like a portrait or a picture of the of the lighthouse. So we've had volunteers help us kind of step up and do things like that, kind of off like onshore activity that we've been able to to get help with so far. But we are looking forward to, uh, you know, more people being able to do some work on the lighthouse. So how can people learn more about the project? But we would love uh, anyone who's interested in our project, we'd love uh, for you to check us out and love for you to become a member. Ways to check us out would be visiting our website, which is www.northmanitoulightkeepers.org. You can also like our page on Facebook or like us or follow us on Instagram. Uh, just look for North Manitou Lightkeepers. You can also email us. And we'd love to hear from you at info at northmanitoulightkeepers.org. So how can people learn more about the progress of your restoration? And also, how can people donate to it? Yes, the website has great information about the nature of our restoration work and a lot of other information. But it has a page devoted to uh, joining as a member and donating to the Lighthouse and shows you different ways to do that. So, Dan, you, you sent me some uh, biographical information I was looking at, and uh, it mentions that you lead a small business enterprise called Hartmonic Holdings, which includes Main Street Gallery and Warm Hearted Home in Leland. I'm really curious what all that is. Sure. Hartmonic Holdings, uh, like you were saying, is a small business enterprise that ha- is comprised of you know different business adventures, the way we like to think about it. And what my wife and I are both trying to do with Hartmonic is do good things that are good for people and help build communities. And if we can, you know, make some money with those business adventures, you know, we can use some of that to help reinvest in our communities. That's the general concept. The Lighthouse Project has actually helped to build out some of that vision in tangible terms, largely because once we started the Lighthouse Project, you know, Leland was going to be a home base for the project. I know I was thinking we're, we're going to be spending time there working on the Lighthouse. I want to spend time there. I want to be part of the community. So we started looking for a place to stay and found a pretty beautiful home for sale on Main Street, right in the heart of Leland. And the owners were using it as a vacation rental in the summer. So that worked out really well for us. And then I went next door and met my neighbor, Malcolm Chatfield, who founded Main Street Gallery in Leland in the 1980s. A couple times after meeting Malcolm, he mentioned that he was looking to perhaps retire soon and maybe sell the gallery. I probably talked with him and thought about it back and forth for about 10 months. My wife and I did end up acquiring Main Street Gallery. It's really a great way to be part of the Leland community and and the Leelanau County community. And especially Main Street Gallery is a a wonderful platform for 25 artists who are part of the gallery to show and, and sell their art. So we're having a lot of fun with that and really enjoying not only Leland, but also the other towns around like uh, Northport, Sutton's Bay, Glen Arbor, Empire, you know, and it's really all part of the Traverse City region too. That's been really great part of the experience is becoming more, you know, part of those communities. And Leland is such a, a nice special town with a strong community. We're really pleased to uh, be more part of that. So it's all, you know, been a lot of hasn't been all fun. It's actually been a lot of work, to be honest with you, a fair amount of anxiety at times, but all the things that we're taking on and trying to do and questions about whether all of this really makes sense with school age kids and all the responsibilities we have. But these things have become part of our life and really helped to build out Heartmonic, um, which has been really cool, too. It sounds like you're contributing an awful lot to the community there, including, of course, the the restoration of the lighthouse and the opening of it to to people. So I have one final question for you for bonus points. What has been your favorite part of your involvement with North Manitoshole Lighthouse? 
I guess there's a couple things come to mind. Probably three things come to mind. I think about like what's the favorite parts of the uh, project and the experience. One is the adventure. I personally have a have a mindset that again isn't always easy, but I have a mindset of wanting to live life, not just go through it. And I love to be on an adventure and and, and build things. And for me personally, the, the locate the the lighthouse being in that location is so beautiful and I love it so much. That's really the inspiration. But a big driver of this experience is the the adventure of, you know, even telling the stories to other people is a good example. Like we're restoring a lighthouse it's on the middle of the lake and you got to get on a boat and climb off the boat and climb this ladder and and just building the organization and, and all of that. It's it's quite an adventure. And that that's a uh, part of why I love it. The second thing is the the friendships and the people, especially the four families we started with this. One thing I thrive on and probably the thing I look for the most is I love working with people to, to do meaningful things um, and create meaningful things in the world. And not only the friendships with those four families mean so much to me and, and we're able to work together on this, but also all of the people who we're you know, coming in contact with and the coast, former Coast Guardsmen and people in the community it's really about the people and sharing the experience and building that community. And that's what I, I personally look for and thrive on. And that's what I'm loving about the experience. And then the third thing is being out at the lighthouse. Like I said, just, it's such a unique experience. It's an offshore lighthouse. And when you walk around the deck, you get a 360 view of Lake Michigan, the Manitou Islands, sleeping bear dunes. It's, it's so amazing. And I love it so much. And it was a dream of mine actually to, um, spend a night on the lighthouse and and I hope to do it more but I realized a dream this summer I had this vision in my head where we'd uh, at some point spending the night in the lighthouse have a couple of uh, lawn chairs and set them on the deck and play some music and watch a sunset over the Manitou Islands we got a chance to do that this summer and and it was amazing so there's so many reasons that this is a cool thing to do and I'm I'm happy to say you know a lot of these are are happening. And, and that's, that's some of my favorite things about it. Dan Oginski, I, I want to congratulate you on everything you and your organization have accomplished so far. It really, really is impressive. And uh, as I said, you look at photos of the, the lighthouse and it looks like it was just built yesterday. And I know there's a, a ways to go, but that is going to be fantastic when you open it for the public next year. So I look forward to, to hearing more about that. Maybe we can talk again sometime. So again, uh, thank you. I wish you continued success in your adventure of restoring the lighthouse and opening it to the public. Dan Oginski, thanks so much for spending time with me today. Awesome. Thank you very much for your interest in our, our project and for talking today. And to you and all your listeners, I'll, I'll say shine on. Next, we're going to talk with my friend Bob Trapani Jr., who is the executive director of the American Lighthouse Foundation. He's well known in the lighthouse preservation world, but today we're going to talk about something a little different. Bob Trapani is also a writer and photographer. What started as family adventures exploring the coast of Maine evolved into something more. And in recent years, Bob has launched a new effort called Moments in Maine. You can access it online at momentsinmaine.com. Moments in Maine is a showcase for the creative work of the Trapani family. In addition to Bob's work, you can see the photography of his son, Dominic, as well as graphic arts items created by Bob's wife, Anne Marie Trapani, and their daughter, Katrina. Bob has published a new book called Rockland Breakwater, A Journey Through the Seasons. In this collection of stunning photography, Bob captures a very special place in mid-coast Maine through four seasons of the year. Rockland Breakwater is a place where you can go to sea without leaving land. I recently spoke with Bob Trapani about these new projects. Let's listen to that conversation now. I'm speaking with my good friend, Bob Trapani Jr. A lot of our listeners I know are familiar with you as the executive director of the American Lighthouse Foundation. It's great to talk to you again. Of course, you and I talk a lot, but we're going to talk about something aside from the American Lighthouse Foundation today, some other things you're involved with. And specifically, uh, we're going to talk about your photography and your new book and uh, the general things under the general heading of Moments in Maine. Maybe you could say a little bit about what led you to start Moments in Maine? Sure. 
Uh, Moments in Maine was really a family uh, idea that came about for all of us here. Uh, it was it was really inspired by wanting to have some relaxation and fun. And, you know, along the coast of Maine, how many places could we visit? It wasn't just lighthouses. It was harbors. It was parks. It was whatever. There's so much happening along the coast of Maine and so much of it's really, truly just tiny moments. And that was what the idea was, was like, could we capture just a little bit of that for people and share some of those interesting moments, maybe some of those insights that not everybody uh, might get to see. And uh, so that's really how that initially came about. And what does Moments in Maine encompass? I think the uh, best way to sum it up would be uh, Moments in Maine is, of course, lighthouses, but also it, it's all about the uh, the coastline, but the maybe even more narrowed down sometimes is really even what you might call a year tidal zone. You know, it's like what happens where land and sea meet. And I think that's uh, that's a big focus of what we do when we're out there, not only with photography, but also you know, just trying to collect thoughts about how do how does this make us feel? You know, so and it all happens within that, you know, where land and sea meet. I know a lot of people listening are familiar with your photography through Facebook or Instagram or, you know, other places. But uh, if people want to look at more of your work and, and uh, the Trapani family's work and uh, everything that falls under the heading of Moments in Maine, they should go to the website, which is momentsinmaine.com, right? That is correct. Yes. And it is it is it's truly a family affair. Um, you know, obviously, Dominic has really continued to grow in the field of photography and does a wonderful job herself. You know, so it uh, it's fun to have the different not only being able to take photographs and, and see these things, but everybody has a different take. Everybody has a different feel for something. So uh, we all have something a little different. And uh, it seems like a, a visual sense seems to run on on both sides of uh, your family. That's that's pretty obvious. And we should mention also your daughter, Katrina, does uh, cards that are also sold through the site, I believe. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, yeah Katrina and Anne have, um, and of course, even my oldest daughter, uh, Nina, uh, they were in that card making end and they decided that it would be really great to just bring some of that card making skills into um, the nautical themed cards and, and the lighthouse type of themed reading cards and other uh, card creations. So yes, uh, Katrina definitely plays a role in that. Yeah. Oh, she does really nice work. Both of your daughters do. Besides lighthouses, what are some of your favorite subjects to photograph around uh, Midcoast Maine area? There is no shortage of subjects to photograph, Jeremy. As you know, next to Portland Harbor, Rockland Harbor is one of the most diverse harbors in Maine. So we have the beautiful historic wind jammers, that, a bunch of them that come out of here, Coast Guard units, uh, tug and barges, ferries, you name it. There's all kinds of, and of course, lobster boats and fishing vessels. So it is a, it's a great working harbor. It gives you a real great sense of place. Uh, you know you're in Rockland or in the Midcoast area, and it's not just Rockland, but if we're talking about something like that. Uh, also, uh, the marine life uh, and, and weather. These all play a role in, in what inspires you to go out there and try to give people an idea of what goes on. I mean, of course, people from an overview have a good idea, but if, if you're not living in, in along the coast, there are just certain things that happen that may only happen once in a while, and if you're fortunate to capture that, you're able to share that. So it's a, it's a challenge, but it's also a ton of fun. Your photography is beautiful, and it's a little different from the average kind of scenic, you know, landscape photography and that sort of thing. What sort of thinking goes into your photography? Is there anything in particular you're trying to capture when you're taking photographs? Well, like everybody, you know, you go out, you don't always know what you're going to encounter. So, of course, if something surprises you, so to speak, it pops up, you, you know, you want to capture that. But a lot of what inspires my photography is uh, how how the coastline inspires me from me uh, being able to write about it, uh, to be able to share a lot of uh, how I feel, emotions and sentiments that I would feel about the coast. I actually try to tailor some of my photography to uh, basically coincide with that, to uh, enhance it. Because I think uh, you get the best of all worlds when you can mesh uh, photography with words. Mm -hmm. uh, one without the other, is always just a touch lacking. So I, I, I look at that as a, as a challenge, but I also say that's really what inspires me uh, to go after some of the more unique angles and things of that nature that, that I'm typically trying to shoot. 
to me, that's what makes your photography so unique is the fact that you tend to capture unusual angles and, uh, and uh, details that a lot of people might miss, uh, which uh, is always it's always fun to, to look at your photography for that reason. Well, you know, it's funny because, you know, some of that work is not for everybody. You know, uh, you know everybody's going to love a, a beautiful landscape photo and they should. Um, but there is elements about photography that um, may not be as, you know, they're not going to get as many likes per se on a, on a social media post or this or that, but um, they're going to speak to certain people. And, and I think that's, that's what I'm after a lot of times is, is just being able to say that this is what I enjoy. And if it, if it does speak to whoever out there, uh, wonderful. I know you like to photograph lighthouses and other subjects all times of year. I love seeing your pictures in the snow, and you'll take pictures in the lantern at Owl's Head and all kinds of uh, crazy weather. Uh, it's always it's always uh, enjoyable to see that stuff. Do you have any memorable experiences you've had while photographing lighthouses and maybe less than terrific conditions? There's always always a challenge with some of that winter photography because, number one, you're trying to be out in a storm when it's kicking up a little bit because you know it's it, at the outset they're not really that impressive so you got to be there when it's kicking up but you don't want to linger too long and find yourself with difficult too difficult travel conditions co coming back but i think uh, for me one of the most interesting ones uh is it would be walking out the rockland breakwater so you as you know jeremy it's, it's like a seven eight mile walk out the breakwater so you know going out's not too bad in, in one of those storms but coming back especially if the um, uh, snow turns to like a sleety, which it does, of course, to, along the coast, to be pelted by such, it, it actually, <laughs> there's some real physical pain and challenges <laughs> dealing with some of that, you know, and then just a numbing cold uh, with some of these days, you know, I mean, you go out there, uh, some people who chase the Arctic sea smoke can attest to the fact that, you know, some of that, some of those days are just really, truly numbing and you, you really want to run for your car at some point. And if your batteries don't go dead in your camera and things of that nature. But there's a beauty about uh, all of that as well. Um, no matter how physically challenging it is, you're out there. You just have to be able to absorb that beauty quicker because you can't linger as long as you would on a spring or autumn day or summer day. But it, it's just gorgeous. And usually there's very few to nobody around. So you really get this sense of, of solitude, of uh, you're just in total isolation. And I think that makes it just not you hear the wind and you hear the sea crashing and uh, you still might hear a gull or two. There can be such wind and such sea action that you almost get the feeling you can't hear yourself think. And uh, it's kind of weird because, you know, I'm not talking to myself, but yet there's these thoughts running through my mind. And, and it's really competing with all of this, um, you know, the storms, uh, the din of the storm, so to speak. And it's pretty impressive, but uh, there is beauty in all of it. And not everybody might consider it beauty, but to see the raw power of nature, you know, at its finest in the winter uh, is, it really is a, it's an amazing experience you don't forget. You mentioned the Rockland Breakwater. Uh, for those listeners who might not be familiar with it, uh, the Rockland Breakwater, as you mentioned, is about seven eighths of a mile long with a lighthouse at the end on the north side of the entrance to the harbor of Rockland in Midcoast, Maine. And uh, I've walked out there myself at dawn and in all kinds of conditions, not quite, not so much winter conditions like you have, but I've been there uh, many times over the years. So let's talk about your new book, which is Rockland Breakwater, A Journey Through the Seasons. What led you to do a book on Rockland Breakwater? Well, the book itself was 10 years in the making and it, I didn't start out thinking that I would do a book on the Rockland Breakwater 10 years ago, say. But it was one of those things where I enjoyed visiting. A lot of times it was with the family. Sometimes it was by myself. After a while, back and forth, going all the time in different times of the year. And I'm saying to myself, wow, I'm starting to see things year to year that I actually don't see from year to year again. Like you, you see it once and then you maybe don't see it ever again. And I'm like, I almost need to just see if I can bring these together. Uh, it, it took some years to get there because, you know, like anything, you think like, you got a great idea, I'll bring a book together and, you know, it goes on the shelf, so to speak, and you say, I'll get to it later. But what it actually did was it allowed me to continue to add to the uh, to the image files. And so I eventually got to the point where I said, you know what, this just needs to happen. And so it did. And it was it, I'm really excited about it because it's a unique place. I tell people that it may be one of the only places where you can go to see without leaving land. 
uh, because you really literally are out in the bay. And if, if that breakwater's not there, there's really no Rockland Harbor. It's just a bigger part of the Penobscot Bay. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's uh, it's pretty amazing to, to be able to walk out that far and uh, you know have the bay on your east side and the, and the harbor on your west side. Well, it's a, it's a great subject for photography and for a book, and your uh, eye for capturing these things is so good. So I haven't actually seen the physical book yet, although I've seen uh, some of the pictures, and it looks fantastic. So I, I really look forward to seeing the, the complete product. We touched on a little bit, but your son, Dominic, is also an incredible photographer. I've known Dominic since he was really small. Uh, really small. I, I remember him being in a car seat. What was that more than 20 years ago now? Uh, yes. he's, he's grown a lot and not just grown as a, you know, in height or all that, but it's been a lot of fun watching his growth of his, as a photographer. And I think of both of you as uh, among the, the best photographers on the coast of Maine. And I understand Dominic also has a book coming out. Is that right? He does. He has a book coming out, uh, on Maine lighthouses. Uh, it's, it's really just kind of the best of his work to this point in his, uh, career of taking photography, it's going to blow people away. I mean, he is such a different photographer than I am that it is it is amazing to watch his growth and to, to see what, how he views lighthouses in the coast. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm blown away. I think people are going to really be impressed by this. And anybody who does follow him knows he, he obviously has, a, has an eye and talent for that. But uh, when you're holding, and I've seen this book, uh, when you're holding this book that people are going to be able to, you know, purchase at some point really soon it, it's it's a it's a great thing it's going to be an addition to anybody's uh, uh love of lighthouse library type of thing so mm -hmm. does the book have a title yet or a working title it sure does jeremy its title is lighthouses of maine a photographic journey we expect delivery of that book actually within the week here wow. so it's going to be made available very soon uh -huh. and it's going to be a hardcover book as well you know so that's uh that's going to be something uh, that's going to add to the flair of the photography itself. Yeah, I'll just mention that you and I are talking uh, on November 6th, but I believe people will be hearing this at the end of November in the podcast. And your book will be available by then, right? The book is already available. It's yeah. actually shipping to people uh, this week. Okay. So we have it in hand and it's actually going out and actually we're doing wholesale on that as well. So um, yeah, it's ready to get going. And people can order it from momentsinmaine.com, right? That is that is correct. Yes. And Dominic's book will that be out in time for Christmas as well? It will be in time for Christmas. We expect it by mid-November at the latest. So it will be shipping before Thanksgiving. Are there any other plans for books or other projects under the heading of Moments in Maine? Uh, there are other books in the works. Uh, I am having a um, a book on Owl's Head Light, uh, similar to the Rockland Breakwater book, but it's going to be on Owl's Head. That's coming out January February of 2021 also am working on the first volume of just random lighthouse stories of interest uh they're going to be short chapters jeremy you're familiar with my new jersey delaware and maryland virginia books correct sure yeah, that were absolutely yeah, they yeah. By, by mist and lace back yeah back in the early 2000s yep. it's going to be similar to that where you're just going to get these stories that run the gamut on all things lighthouse from storms to tragedies to oddities and so i'm working on the first volume for maine uh and that should also come out about the same time as well so i have one more question for bonus points of all the things that fall under the moments in maine umbrella what do you enjoy most to me the the most enjoyable aspect is the next adventure going out there and not having a clue what i'm going to discover and then as it happens in front of me, being able to say, well, what speaks to me and how can I share that? Or how can I tuck that away for a project or maybe it's a social media post, maybe it's a blog post, but just being able to say, okay, this unique thing happened. And that's what's so fun about it. And you don't have to be out at any given time of day. You, you don't have to be at any specific spot along the coast of Maine because truly you could be anywhere along the coast of Maine. And I think that's the most fun about it is, is, uh, you just never know what adventure, what new discoveries you're going to find. And when you do, can are they worth sharing? Will people enjoy them? That's the challenge and the fun of it all. And I can tell you that people do enjoy all the things you're able to, to capture, and, and Dominic, too. 
and uh, you know people love seeing your work on Facebook and Instagram and elsewhere and I know people are gonna love these these books that are coming out so again let me just mention again that people can see uh, the work of the Trapani family and news about all the projects that are going on at momentsinmain.com. And Bob, I want to thank you so much for speaking with me today. And uh, I know we'll be speaking soon about various things. It's a, always a pleasure, Bob. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jeremy. I, I have a fun on these. It's, a, it's great. You do a wonderful job on all of this. And uh, keep up the great work. Again, to learn more about Bob Trapani's Moments in Maine and Bob's new book on the Rockland Breakwater, go to momentsinmaine.com. As always, a big thank you to all the staff, volunteers, and members of the U.S. Lighthouse Society and all its chapters and affiliates. The USLHS offers tours, a quarterly journal, a research catalog, and much more. The Society's YouTube channel has more than 60 videos. Just get on YouTube and search for USLHS. And there are all kinds of things to explore on the Society's website at uslhs.org. Memberships and donations to the U.S. Lighthouse Society support this podcast and other lighthouse preservation and education projects. If you listen to this podcast through Apple Podcasts, please rate and review us. Thanks for being with me today, Michelle. And to everyone, as always, thanks so much for listening and keep a good light. Oh, I'm gonna let it shine